All right, well, we're going to be talking about courage to stand for truth today. You could ask the question off of that title, well, what is truth? That'd be a good question. What is truth? Somebody might say, well, I have my own truth, you have your truth, but what is truth? That'd be a good question. It was July, the same month we're in right now, 1972, President Nixon had invited Johnny Cash to come to the White House to sing some songs. And he said, Johnny Cash, I want you to sing this song and that song. Johnny Cash got there, but he didn't sing the songs that President Nixon asked him to sing. Instead, he sang a song that caught the president off guard. You have to remember that the Vietnam War was going on, and he sang a song called What is Truth? He sang another song that was called the, Ira, the Ballad of Ira Hayes about how the American indigenous people were being mistreated. And then he, he sang another song about why he wore black, because he wore it as a, to be in solidarity with those that are oppressed and beaten down and lonely. And uh, the report says that President Nixon had a frozen smile on his face because it wasn't what he expected. The song that he sang, What is Truth? Let me give you a couple of the lyrics to that. Because it, it could be for today. You would think it was written in 2021. The young man speaking in the city square, we might say the young man speaking online, is trying to tell someone that he cares. Yeah, the ones that you're calling wild are going to be the leaders in a little while. This whole world's waking to a newborn day, and I solemnly swear it'll be their way. You better help the voice of youth find what is truth, and the lonely voice of youth cries, what is truth? That was 1972. I think in 2021, the lonely voice of youth is still saying, what is truth? So it's a good question. What is truth? John 17, 17, Jesus said this, sanctify them in the truth. Then he says, your word is truth. In John chapter 14, verse 6, you'll know this verse. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is saying, I am truth. When we say courage to stand for truth, we could say courage to stand for Jesus, the one and the same. In John chapter 18, verse 37, when Jesus is before Pilate, therefore Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I've come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So it's important for us to hear his voice. One of the things that we do at our services now since COVID came along, we've changed some things and you'll find if you're first time back, you'll see something a little bit different. After the message in the last song, we have something called overtime. And the reason we have overtime at our campuses, you guys are doing it there with your campus pastors. What we do is we take a few moments to say, okay, let's really break this down and let's really hear what was being said. Uh, it's possible to hear a message and walk out the door that you, for, you totally forgot what was being said. I know that's true because sometimes people will say, Pastor, that was a good message. And I'll say, well, what was it about? Um, it was a good message, Pastor. Can you give me one of the points? And they go like, oh, well, good to, we'll see you next week. <laughs> So what we want to do is make the message sticky. And one of the things that we do is we want to take a little bit of time and process it. Jesus said if the truth is like a seed. It can land on a sidewalk and a bird will pick it up and take it away. Or it could land in good soil and produce a hundredfold. So by taking a few moments after the service to process it, what happens is the word sticks in our heart better and produces the fruit that we need. For the Christian... Jesus is the truth, and the Bible is the truth. And we need to be aware of the changes that are happening in our world today. We should be aware. We can't be having our head in the sand. We should know there's a lot of changes happening in our world today. And, and change will come. It's inevitable, just like it did in the 70s. And in the time of change, there comes distorted images and uncertain worldviews. And people will see the world through different lenses. Different views. You might ask, well, what are the worldviews? Let me summarize a couple worldviews that are out there. Everybody has a lens that they see life through. This is how you see where we came from. This is how you see how to handle suffering and, and crises. This is how you see your purpose. This is how you see what will happen after you die. This is how you see God. This is how you see people. This is how you see the past, the present, the future. We all look through a lens. 
And we have to understand as we stand for truth and are courageous in that way, that not everybody sees the world the way we see it. And you have to begin with that. Paul did that when he went to Mars Hill. He knew that they were seeing life differently, and he, he, he didn't oppose them on that. He just used that as an opportunity to introduce them to his view. He didn't force it on them. He was gently showing them, let me show you another way to view things. I am not very good at Instagram. If you follow me on Instagram, and there's like 50 who do, if you follow me on Instagram, uh, you know what, you know that I post something maybe once a month. You know why I only post once a month? Because I can't figure out how to do it. I know it's supposed to be easy, I know. But I'll get a picture and I'll think, this is a good picture. This would be good on Instagram. I think people would like this. And then here comes the hard part. I don't know if it's a hashtag, if it's an at sign, if it's multiple pictures. And so I just say, you know what? This is going to take me 40 minutes to figure this out. I'm just going to pass. Sometimes I've said, this is a good picture. I'll send it to my assistant, Julianne. Julianne, just do the write-up because I don't know what to write up. Just write it up and then I'll, I'll put it up there. One thing I did learn about Instagram, and this is kind of cool. You, you all know this, so you'll be like, well, we're glad you caught up, Pastor. Okay, <laughs> this is what I figured out. When you have the picture, there's a little button that says next, and then you have all these different filters. Cool. It can go black and white. If I got a picture that's lousy, it makes it look different. And uh, so all of a sudden I have all these different images because it went through a different filter and the picture looks different. You know what? Everybody has a lens or a filter, and they're seeing the world through their filter. And it's good for us when we say, I'm a believer, and I stand for Christ, I stand for truth. I understand that not everybody's looking through our own lens. Just know that there's different lenses that are out there that people are viewing things, and use that as an opportunity to introduce your view as you stand for truth. You say, well, what are some of these worldviews? Well... For some people, their lens, everything is through the lens of money. When they look at it, it's all about having more money, more success, more wealth. That's how they measure success. Forbes will give you the wealthiest pe people of the world. And that's how, that's the lens many people look through. Jesus had a very different view. In Luke 12, 15, he said, A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. In a biblical worldview, you see that your valuables don't determine your value. Your net worth doesn't determine your self-worth. Remember, the greatest things in life, I'm pausing for effect, the greatest things in life aren't things. I saw that picture of water baptism, all the people around that individual baptized. You know what the greatest thing there was? The support, the community. It wasn't money, it was the support. For some people, that's their lens. Though. Everything looks through that. How can I make more money? How can I have more stuff? It's a lens of materialism, and that's a, a worldview. For some, they look their, their worldview, it's all about pleasure. And ultimately, your worldview is how you see things, but really, it's what you dedicate your life to. Or, can I be so bold to say, what you worship. Years ago, Bob Dylan had a song that said, you're going to worship somebody. Everybody worship somebody. It may be the devil or maybe the Lord, but you're going to worship somebody. Everybody worships something. For some, it's pleasure. Proverbs 21, 17 says, you, are you addicted to thrills? What an empty life. The pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied. For some, that's their lens, everything they do. They just buy another can of Red Bull and say, okay, another thrill. Here I go. They live for that. For some, their worldview is the government is going to solve all the problems. And government is good. It was invented by God. Three institutions, the family, the church, government, were, were, those were God's ideas. God is not an anarchist. He's for good government. But government isn't the solution ultimately for our lives. For some people that don't pray to God, they look for the government to solve all their problems. And so that's their worldview. Government's going to solve it all. For others, nature is God. 
Look what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 15 to 19. But be very careful, exclamation mark. You did not see the Lord's form on the day he spoke to you from the heart of the fire at Mount Sinai. So do not corrupt yourselves by making an idol in any form, whether a man or a woman, an animal on the ground, a bird in the sky, a small animal that scurries along the ground or a fish in the deepest sea. And when you look up into the sky and see the sun, moon, and stars, all the forces of heaven, don't be seduced into worshiping them. The Lord your God gave them to all the peoples of the earth. For some, it's a matter of... It's all about the earth. It's all about the universe. I center my life around this. We, we can call that pantheism. Genesis chapter 1, where it says, and God created the heavens and the earth, that is a very radical statement. Why? Because it says God is outside of nature. If I put up a painting on the wall, I can see that artist reflected in the painting, but the painting is not the artist. It reflects him, but it's not the painting. Likewise, we see God in all of creation, but he is not creation. He is God. So there's a difference. You know, it was Darwin who said, it's the survival of the fittest. And if you worship nature, that's the deal. But for a biblical view, it's not survival of the fittest. It's survival of the weakest. Didn't Jesus say, I've come to heal the brokenhearted? If you're weary, you're weak, lame, come to me. He expects the strong to help the weak, not devour the weak. So it's a different view, a different lens to look through. And the last one that in a worldview is this worldview of individualism. Now, nobody says, or at least very few people would say, I am God. But really, that's what it boils down to. It's all about me. And, and our world will advertise and cater to that. Obey your thirst. You, you deserve this. Uh, uh, we, we did it all for you. Have it your way. And, and that's the message that's sent, and it feeds that. Now, this is big news this morning for you, that God didn't create you for you. Let me say that again. God didn't create you for you. Our design and our purpose is to live, and our fulfillment comes when we help others and worship the God who created us. You know, at 9 o'clock service, it was really quiet right about here. <laughs> Last night at the 5 o'clock service, it was really quiet right about here. So I'm just going to assume that you're thinking a lot. And I could even see it online and there at our camp. Well, I mean, no, it's really kind of quiet. So it gets better. Let me go on to this next question you might ask. Next question you might ask is, is it always a challenge to speak out for Jesus for truth? The answer is yes. Going back to John 7, 13, right at the beginning, it says here that no one had the courage to speak favorably. Look at that word, favorably, about Jesus in public. Favorably. It might be kind of the same today. Now, if you swear and use Jesus' name in vain, you're not going to have any pushback. Nobody's going to give you any hard time about that. But if you said, I believe Jesus is the Savior of the world, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, there's going to be some pushback. You're going to have to have courage to stand for that. When it comes to having courage for stand for things, you know, a lot of things in the Bible, the world, will they'll, they'll have no problem agreeing with you on that. If you say, we need to take care of creation, they'd say, we're with you, absolutely. If you say, we should be good Samaritans. They'll say, absolutely. We even have a law in B.C. called the Good Samaritan Law. If you say, we should have justice. There should be equity. There should be fairness. People will agree with all of that. But as I was studying this, I thought, where, where, where does it really take courage to stand for truth, to stand for our Lord? When he calls something holy, if we said, this is the Holy Bible, divinely inspired, there'll be some pushback. When you say Jesus' name is holy, there'll be some pushback. It'll take courage to say that. If you say marriage is holy, sex is holy, these are things that are set apart, sanctified by God, that will take some courage. And you might say, well, 
When I read the Bible, I like parts of the Bible. I like this part, and I like that part. I like, I'm not going to take that part, and I'm not going to take that part. I'm just going to cherry pick what I want. That's very presumptuous. That really is saying, I'm putting myself above God. I'm going to pick what I want, and I'm, I'm actually going to take a little bit of this as well, and a little bit of that, and this will be, quote, unquote, my truth. That's syncretism. That's you combining different things into one. Where what God's challenging us to do here is say, trust me in my word that it is true. It takes courage. Even Paul struggled with it. Acts 18, verse 19, verse 9, it says, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. So that tells me even the great apostle Paul was afraid to speak up sometimes. So if you've ever been afraid to speak up, you're not the only one. Boy, sometimes I've been afraid to speak up. I was working on a, on a drilling rig. You know my story. I started as a roughneck, and working as a roughneck on this rig in, in Alberta. It was called Challenger Number 44. Remember the rig? It was a, it was a deep hole that we're drilling, 20,000 feet, long shifts, I'm in what was called the doghouse, which basically was the control shack. It's a graveyard shift, and I'm, I'm having my meal. I open up my lunch bucket. As I open my lunch bucket, the driller, who would be like the, the crew chief, says to me, Dave, you go to church, don't you? I tried to keep that a secret, but he found out. I was, I was a secret agent Christian, just kept everything on the down low. And He says, you don't swear much. Much. Sometimes I did swear. <laughs> Have to repent. <laughs> it just slipped out. You know, when you're around people that swear all the time, sometimes it, you don't want to. It just, has anybody else had that happen? You know, I can't believe I said that. But you just kind of round it all the time. Anyhow, he says, you don't swear much. <laughs> you, I'm just, this is where the rubber hits the road. And uh, he said, you go to church. So I want to know what you believe anyhow. What do you believe anyhow, Coop? Guess what I did? I closed my lunch bucket and I walked out. Didn't have courage. Walked away. I wish I had that moment over again. Because evidently, my life, even though I wouldn't call myself a great example of a believer, especially at that point, it was salty enough that he was asking questions. But I didn't have the courage to stand for truth. Fast forward a number of years later, uh, after, you know, there's something about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says you should receive power when the Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. And I have to say, when Sharon and I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, it changed. We had a courage to stand for truth like we didn't have before. I didn't share this in the other services, and I don't know if I'm going to get the rest of my message if I share it, but I'm just going to take a chance. Uh, here. I was working for a company that we sold engineered chemicals into refineries and into uh, potash plants, et cetera. And we were having a, a meeting in Calgary. Where all our reps had come together. And, and uh, you know, they knew I was a Christian. Oh, boy, man. And uh, I, I'm sure maybe some of you guys can relate to it if you worked in sales or you work in the, You know what they tried to do? They'd always try to get me to go to a strip club. It was a big joke. Let's get Coop to go to a strip club. And I'd figure it out beforehand. I never went. Just so you know, I didn't go. And then one time they took me to Yuck Yucks. Ever heard of Yuck Yucks? It's a comedy club. And so I'm at Yuck Yucks, and I'm with them. I said, okay, it's a comedy, you know, and they get up, and the guy's mocking Jesus. And I'm going, I'm not going to take this. So I get up, and I walk out of Yuck Yucks, and everybody can see me, and so I become the target of his comedy. So he's, he's, he's ridiculing me as I'm walking out. I said, I don't care, I'm walking out. And so the next end of our, our week there, they said, that we're going to go for supper. And uh, I said, well, where are we going for supper? Because I was just leery, you know. They, they thought this was a big joke. And they said, don't worry. It's a Greek restaurant. It'll be cool. It's a Greek restaurant. I said, okay. I like Greek food. So I went to the Greek restaurant. We sat down. And uh, as we're sitting there, a belly dancer comes by. I've never been in a restaurant in my life with a belly dancer. I don't know what to do with belly dancers. I have no idea. All I know is to get out. And so I said, guys, excuse me. Fari, why are you laughing? <laughs> You going to talk about this in overtime or what? <laughs> you're a dancer, so maybe that's why you're laughing. I don't know. So 
This belly dancer comes by. I say, okay, God, I'm out of here. I don't have to have this. And I get up to leave, and you'd be, I'd be surprised, but God said, stay right there. I said, but God. Said, no, no, it's okay. Stay. You know, Jesus sat with sinners. He knew their world. And so I, I stayed. And she never came back. She did a little thing and went to some other tables. We never saw her again. But that night, at that table, they were ordering drinks. Everybody was laughing. One of the women on the team looked across the table at me and said, David, you're, you're a Christian, aren't you? I go, yeah, I am. She said, I don't understand this. Why do you Christians always talk about the blood of Jesus? Well, <laughs> that time I had courage. And I said, well, let me tell you why that's so special. And after that conversation, one of the other guys who was senior on the team, he also was an undercover Christian, and he said, I have to admit, I too am a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and later on that year, I would lead another fellow named Alan between Edmonton and Calgary. He came to know Jesus Christ as a Savior. But see, it was in that moment. They all had different worldviews. Some of them definitely was pleasure. Some of them definitely was all about money. And one of the guys on our team, he really worshipped nature. He gave me his whole theory that we were living in what was really a big aquarium. And that was his, he had this worldview. It was very different. And I don't think we, we, I never would put down the worldview. I just wanted to understand it. That night, it, 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 was, it, was, it changed people's lives. Are there people in the Bible that had to stand for truth? Of course, there's lots of them. One of them was the three Hebrew boys that we read about in Daniel, and Ali had referred to it. These guys were taken captive to Babylon, and there they were indoctrinated in the universities of the day. They had to eat their food, wear their clothes, totally had to change and be adopting that culture. They were asked to look through the lens of the day, and you know what's the most radical thing was they had their names changed at our campuses. How would you like to have your name changed? The name that your mom or your dad, well, some might say, well, I wish they would change it. But uh, for the most part, we, we're glad for the name we have. Here's what the names they were given. Daniel, whose name was God is my judge, was given the name Belshazzar, which means Bel is my judge, one of the Babylon gods. Shadrach, you'll know, and his name originally was Hananiah, which means God is gracious and he was given the name illuminated by the sun god, Meshach. His original name was Michel, which was who is like God. Meshach means who is like Venus, Abednego. His original name was Azariah, the Lord is my helper. And his name was to give him to him was the, the worshiper of Nego. So these guys, if ever was somebody that had to, was in a world that was so contrary to what, how they were raised, how they saw the world, how they saw God, they were in the middle of it. So Nebuchadnezzar builds a big statue. Everybody has to bow to it. And this was a deal. They had brought a big band together, and they said, at the sound of the band, everybody has to bow down. And, of course, we know the story. These guys didn't bow. Ali did a great job leading worship today. Music's powerful. Uh, of course, we know God's into worship. And music has an effect on you, doesn't it? Because it'll, it'll cause you to do things that normally you, you might not do. Worship is powerful. Music is powerful. Give me the beat, boys. Free my soul. I want to get lost in your rock and roll and drift away. <laughs> Bob Seger. You know that song? I can't sing it, but you got the point. You didn't see that coming, did you, campuses? <laughs> What does he go on to say in that song? He says, the world's so unkind, help me to get through. He, he, you see, the music will move you. And music was moving them. It's, it's, it's important that let music move you for the right thing. So they're, they don't bow. They get thrown into a furnace. And it's heated up very hot. But here's the close. In the fire, somebody else shows up. And the Nebuchadnezzar, the king, looks and says, who is that? We threw three people in there, but there's four. What's going on? That last one looks like the Son of God. It was a Son of God. In theology, we call that a Christophany, Christ appearing in the Old Testament. 
Jesus was with them through the influence of their parents, through the influence of their growing up, even though they were taken away from their home, their family, and indoctrinated with another culture, they didn't bow. They had the courage to stand for truth. They had this, they had a, somehow they had a, a strong relationship with God. I think one of the things that keeps you strong is to have, like they did, a small group. Those three guys with Daniel, I think that was their life group. They had courage to stand for truth. Well, I've run out of time. Much more could be said, but I want to pray for you today. Maybe you're having to stand for truth. Maybe you're having to be courageous. At our campuses, online, here this morning, let me pray for you today. You don't have to raise your hand or stand up or anything, but if you need courage in your life today, would you just take a moment and let me pray for you. Just open up your heart to receive this morning. Father, you see everybody watching online at our campuses, those here today, and we need courage to stand for truth. Maybe it's at our workplace, like it was for me, or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's online, or maybe it's family, but we're being challenged for our beliefs. Maybe, maybe we think of some others that have had persecution in other countries, or even in our own land. God, I pray, grant them the courage, the power to be a witness as only you can. You love the world, Jesus. You love us. And so we receive that strength today. With your heads bowed, eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. He is Lord. He will lead you to truth. He'll lead you to strength and to peace that nothing else can give. He is the answer. Just pray with me a simple prayer to invite him into your heart. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, this Sunday morning, I accept Jesus Christ into my heart. Lead me into truth. I receive you now. Amen.